Lord, as we think on these things, that's the truth of who we are. You came down. We could have never made it up. You came down to us. And the life that we now live, we live because of our good shepherd, the one who loves his sheep, the one who laid down his life for his sheep, the one who is eternally good to his sheep. Father, we thank you tonight that we are yours. Lord, that's a truth. That's not a statement. It's not something we just mouth with our lips. It's who we are. For we're yours. You've gathered us in. You brought us near. And you brought us near by your blood. And so, Lord, as we again just take some time now to sit at your feet and learn of you. Holy Spirit, come and speak to us as your people, Lord. Would your still small voice move in our midst tonight? Would we know you? Could we feel you? Could we sense you? Would you breathe on us, Lord? Would you whisper in our ear? We love you. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you. And God's amazing sheep all said. Amen. 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 You know, as I was worshiping, we were up at the men's retreat, and Pastor Don had shared from the 23rd Psalm, and the 23rd Psalm, as all of you know, is the shepherd's psalm. It's David's psalm. It's the psalm of the sheep. And as last time we were together on Sunday night, you may have remembered that he's the door of the sheep. He's laying right there in the sheepfold door, and he keeps out the wolves. And he's also in the sheepfold door so that he can take the sheep into green pastures. You ever tied those two things together? And tonight, we'll pick up in John chapter 10, verse 11, but before we get there, the Lord is, the 23rd Psalm says, my shepherd. And I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And I want you to see something as we read this before we move on to the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. Because there's utter confidence in the shepherd. There's no doubt about the character of the shepherd. There's not a single hint of fear about the shepherd. There's not a tinge of anxiety about the goodness of the shepherd. There's not a bit of misgiving about the shepherd. And I believe it's because David knew the shepherd was good. The shepherd's not kind of good. He isn't like we are. We have good days and bad days. Amen? The good shepherd never has bad days. Amen? For he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. You see the confidence? He leads me in the path of righteousness. There's, there's no doubt. There's, there's no questioning. These things are statements. For his name's sake, he does these things. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Not I might fear some evil. I will fear zero no evil. 
Why? Because the good shepherd is with me. David wasn't concerned about being abandoned by the good shepherd. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Now, see, we don't think of correction. We don't think often of instruction. We don't think of that necessary leading and guiding sometimes as being a comfort. But oh, how comforting it is to know that when there's one way to go, the good shepherd knows which way. Amen? Amen. For you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Every good and perfect gift flows down from our Father of lights who's in heaven. Amen? Do you see the goodness of the shepherd that David knew a thousand years before the good shepherd showed up? Why? Because he was also the good shepherd before the foundation of the world. He, he was already the good shepherd. He didn't become the good shepherd when he came to earth. He already was the good shepherd. He's been nothing but the good shepherd forever. My cup runs over. That's another way of saying the good shepherd has blessed me so much that I have blessings to give. My cup runs over. For surely goodness, the untold favor of the good shepherd and mercy even though I wander he's not going to beat me aren't you glad the good shepherd doesn't beat wandering sheep amen now he may take the rod of correction to you but it's going to be appropriate for wherever you've wandered and it will only be as much as you need it'll never be more Truly goodness and mercy shall follow me. All, notice it, circle it, underline it. All of the days of my life. The good shepherd is good all of the days of the life of the sheep. You see, that's certainty. That's not uncertainty. That's not the frivolousness of our world, amen? Amen. You know, it used to be that, you know, when I was in business, your word was your bond. What you said was the very same thing as, as staking your life, your reputation, and everything else that you owned on it. And now it's what you say has to be interpreted given the circumstances. Amen? It's like, well, I didn't really mean that. When the good shepherd says that he's good, when David said the shepherd that he's following is good all the days of my life, goodness and mercy all of the day, it wasn't a debatable issue. It was not a changing perspective. It was not character that would be different one day than the next. And then he finishes it with, and I will positive statement of fact. Kind of like the Clippers game last night. We will win. Chris Paul threw up that last minute shot. You know, I'm going, oh no, here it is again. No, it was, we will. And in that wonderful sense, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, that Lord that was David's shepherd was also the same good shepherd, the I am the good shepherd of John chapter 10. So if you turn there now, verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You ever thought about how absolutely crazy that is in a worldly sense? Now, if you've ever seen sheep, when sheep are in a herd, when they're wandering through the hillsides, when we traveled to Israel, when you see a shepherd with his sheep, the flocks are huge. 
It's like, there's got to be two or three of them in there that we can lose, okay? Maybe there's one in there It's just kind of not doing too well. We'll just kind of give that sheep away. Now the inference is here in the original language that the good shepherd gives his life for every last one of all of the sheep. But a hireling, he who's not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. A hireling flees because he is a hireling. He doesn't care about the sheep. You see, there's a lot of pastors that aren't shepherds. There's a lot of people who pretend to be doing the work of the Lord. But when it gets down to the sheep, you can't find the shepherd. Jesus won't do that, and neither should pastors who claim to be shepherds. For I am the good shepherd, he repeats it. Jesus speaking, I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, for I lay down my life for the sheep. There's a oneness, there's a completeness. And other sheep which I have that are not of this fold, also them I must bring. For they will hear my voice. He's talking about those original sheep. The ones that Abraham, Isaac, they heard his voice too and they waited for him to set them free. Can you imagine the look on Abraham's face when Jesus showed up on Resurrection Day? Abraham, it's time to go home. Grab Isaac. Let's get Moses because we're heading home. You waited in faith. It's time to go. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Notice how many flocks there are. Remember what I said this morning? If you were with us, there's only one flock. It's only really one church. Many different expressions of that church, but there's only one because there's only one good shepherd. And therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up. This command I've received from my father. Interesting what happens in the middle of this passage And therefore there was a division among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of of them said, he has a demon, he's mad, why do you listen to him? You, You see, they were looking for the Davidic shepherd. That was one of the names for the Messiah. That's exactly who they were looking for. Ezekiel chapter 34 pictures that one shepherd over the flock of Israel. They knew who it would be. And Jesus is now claiming to be that shepherd. This guy's crazy. He's mad. And others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? You see, they they got a dose of reality as Jesus was doing only what God could do. They knew Messiah would be God. They had no doubt. And Jesus had done that. And now it was the feast of the dedication in Jerusalem. And it was winter, and Jesus walked into the temple in Solomon's porch, and the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them. So this is the response to the Jewish religious leaders, those who were religious scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders of the Jewish people, asking a question, are you the Messiah or not? And Jesus said, I already told you, and you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. I've already given you enough signs. I've already showed you who I am, he said to them but you do not believe. 
Why? Because you were not of my sheep, as I said to you. For my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and my Father are one. These two passages of Scripture, separated by almost a thousand years in their authorship, humanly speaking. As John authored these words, he's now writing probably in the, in the mid-40s to maybe the mid-60s A.D. David wrote about a thousand years B.C., B.C.E. if you prefer. And so as these two things are etched parchment by pen, it seems as though, now how could that be? The good shepherd is also the shepherd of the sheep. The good shepherd is the shepherd of the flock. I'll tell you what, family, this is exactly the one that we need in our turbulent times. Amen? Because we need this kind of stability in our lives. We need this type of certainty in uncertain times. We need this type of care in a world that is completely careless. Kind of coming back or driving down Western, grabbing a little dinner, and you know, I'm just watching the hurried pace with which people are going from place to place, seemingly going nowhere, and nearly willing to, to drive over somebody who steps off the sidewalk to get there. You know, life almost has no value at times anymore in our world. And yet Jesus says, I lay down my life for my sheep. That were he here tonight and there was something going on in our lives, any of our lives who love him, Jesus would gladly say to you, I will give my life for that sheep. Take my life, not theirs. So different than the world. And each one of these I am statements that we've looked at, and we'll finish them up here in a week or two, are following the same formula. The formula that was expressed to Moses uh, there in Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. You don't need to necessarily go there, but you can look later. And he uses a tetragrammatron. He, he, he uses YHVH, the same way that if you have someone in your life who happens to be a, a devout Hebrew, uh, they do not say the name of God. And in fact, if they write it, they'll usually write G hyphen D so that they are not confused in that they may have somehow blasphemed the Lord's name. To them, he was known as Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh. The same Yahweh that was with Moses. The same one that stuttering Moses came to that burning bush. You remember the story, right? Moses is not exactly having his finest hour, is he? He's like, look, I don't know what to say. What am I supposed to say when I go to the people? And the burning bush spoke to him and said, you tell them I am who I am has sent you. I am past. I am present, and I am future. I always was, I always will be, and I never will not be I am. You see, he was really speaking those things so that when we hear them repeated by Jesus, Jesus is declaring himself to be God. The Jews who were listening knew this, it's the very reason they picked up rocks to stone him. The moment that he associated himself with the I am of the burning bush, he said, you're claiming to be God. There was no mistaking what Jesus said. And so in that vein, he says, look, the good shepherd knows his sheep. I'm glad the good shepherd knows me because there's times when I don't know me that well, amen? 
I don't know how you all respond, but there are times in my life where I'm kind of wondering, you know, who am I? You ever had those times in your life where you're, you know, am I really like this or am I like this? Is this my character? Is that my character? Is this the way I really want to live my life? You, you see, when we look at the, the good shepherd, the first thing that comes into view for us is he's exactly the opposite of bad. When you think of him as the good shepherd, you have to also compare him to the bad shepherd. Notice how he uses that analogy here. Look, the fake shepherd, the false shepherd, doesn't care about sheep. But the good shepherd, who's always good, always cares about the sheep. There's no contingency for wayward sheep to be dealt with any other way than goodness. There's no contingency for dirty sheep to be met with anything other than goodness. Notice there's no, like, subgroup of sheep. You ever looked at this that way? It's like, okay, well, what about the mediocre sheep? What about the stupid sheep? You ever think of that one? You know, the sheep that just do dumb things. Anybody in here ever do dumb things? Two hands, one leg, if I could get them both off the ground, I'd have, you know, yeah, sheep do dumb things, amen? There's no contingency plan. The good shepherd lays down his life for all the sheep. The really super sheep, you know, they have like a big S on their fur. I am super sheep. Well, now I think about stupid sheep would also have an S. <laughs> and sheep in general have, so everyone with an S, all of the sheep. You see how it works? Oh, he lays down his life for all the sheep, no matter what kind of sheep you are. No matter how good a sheep, how bad a sheep, a mediocre sheep, there, they could have M's. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep because he's always good even if we're not good. What does the book of Hebrews say? He is faithful even when we are faithless. Paul writing to Timothy, the same thing. You see, he's always good. There's nothing he can't do, nothing he won't do. So it's a responsibility of us sheep to trust him. He doesn't change, we do. You know, very, very often people will come to me and say, you know, I'm just not feeling the Lord in my life. And I will usually say something to the effect, you might want to check and see if you're still in the sheepfold. You may want to look and see who actually moved because the shepherd's still in the door. And he's still good. He still loves you. But maybe you've moved someplace where the shepherd's not as visible in your life. Maybe you've started to hang out with wolves instead of sheep. That's a bad deal, by the way. I want you to see something because he is always good. But notice six things that we find in the 23rd Psalm that are ours because of the good shepherd. I shall not lack peace and rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He doesn't make me lie down in patches of cactus. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And notice he makes me to do that. Anybody else in here have a tough time turning it off? I don't have an off switch. I don't know what it is. If you ask Connie, she'll tell me he's always like that. I admit it. I'm weird. I don't really know how to rest all that well. In fact, a number of years ago, we got, got in the habit to where when we go on vacation, I don't take my cell phone, I don't take my computer, I don't take anything. Matter of fact, I'm not allowed to bring cans and string. <laughs> Brandon, where are you? You know, I'll, I'll talk to the boys in a better, you know, I'll, it, that's just the way I am. I have a tough time resting. Anybody else have a tough time resting? Man, I need rest. The good shepherd takes us to a place of rest. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And he leaves me beside the quiet or the still waters. You see, that's peace, that's rest, and we need that in our world, don't we? We're always going. 
Probably some of you have friends, and I want to be a little careful here, but they somehow got involved in multi-level marketing. Isn't that sweet? And you know, it's 12.30 at night, and they're trying to sell you goji berry coated chocolate bars that are made in Honduras or something. You know, it's just... They're always, they got some angle on everything. And everywhere you go, they pull out some, you know, here's my card. They offer it to your dog. (laughs) You tell them the dog can't read. They're always going. That's kind of our life, isn't it, at times? Aren't we like that? Don't we need peace? Don't we need rest in our lives? Don't we need a break? We get that in Jesus, the Good Shepherd. We won't have any lack in our life. Why? Because he restores our soul. He sustains the life of the sheep. You can have a lot of things in life, but if your life is falling apart, if your life is blown up, if your life is out of control, you can't even enjoy what you have. That's why so very often, and not all, but many people who have substantial means are actually miserable even though they have about everything that you can think of. Connie and I were like that. Totally like that. Miserable. Had everything that you could ever ask for. And it really wasn't until the Lord took it away that we understood what the peace of God was. You're not going to lack direction because he guides me in paths of righteousness. Notice that word righteousness. It doesn't say rightness. Would you please underline righteousness? Righteousness is seeing things from God's perspective, amen? It's not just being right. Right and righteous are two different things. They can be the same at times. The right way is almost always the righteous way, but it's not necessarily, you can have the facts correct and still be unloving, can't you? Righteousness makes you loving while you have the facts correct. He leads us in paths of righteousness. You're not going to have the wrong direction. You're going to have the right direction. You're not going to lack safety. Do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? That kind of sounds like a bad place, doesn't it? I don't know where that is, but I know I've been there. Amen? You know what I'm saying? You've been in those circumstances, those situations for a very, very, very long time. I was a rock climber. And I can tell you there have been times when I've been in places on climbs where it's just like, I'm going to die. It's kind of a, it's a helpful thing. (laughs) Death awaits. Because there's something about plunging 2,000 feet to your death that most of us do not want to do. But sometimes we get ourselves into situations to where there's a very real possibility that this is not a good place. And, And he says, look, if you walk through the valley of shadow of death, I'm with you. I'm there. Doesn't mean we can be silly. Doesn't mean we should be flippant about our choices. But the Lord's with us, even in the worst times of our lives. You're not going to lack provision because he prepares a table before me in the presence of your enemies. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever actually thought about this, but what he's really saying is, is, okay, so when the enemy comes and attacks you, I'm going to set up a feast. So when the enemy sees you feasting, the enemy's going to know you're mine. You ever had those people in your life say, man, how come you're so peaceful? How come you're so quiet? Don't you have anything bad going on in your life? You go, yes, I do. But the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. I have peace in the storm. doesn't say he's going to remove the storm. He just says, I'll be there with you. And one of the things that just has always struck me about this psalm, you're never going to lack a heavenly home. You know, sometimes when we look at our lives here on this earth, and I talk to people all the time, it's just like, I'd just like to have, you know, I'd like to get out of an apartment. I'd like to be in a home. And I think most people have a desire to be someplace that we could call home. If you're here tonight and you are a child of God, you have a heavenly home. You may be homeless on this earth, but you have a mansion waiting for you in heaven. And that, again, that's not to diminish the difficulty 
that we go through here on this earth. It's to actually recognize it. It's to say, look, these things are tough. They're hard. They hurt. There are things that we don't like. There are things that we don't want for other people, and yet they sometimes come into our lives. I've lived in my car. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to cook a ramen and macaroni and cheese on a backpacking stove in a car. I know what that feels like. But I also know what it's like to be fabulously wealthy. And I can tell you there's no hope in either end. My hope is in heaven. Because he puts into perspective all the things in our lives, whether they're the most fabulous things that we would call good on this earth or whether they're the most desperate things that we would just call evil on this earth, the Lord still got it under control. And so as we begin to look through the remainder of this, you, see, you can kind of see how as the Lord would just speak these things into our lives, you, you see, we're supposed to be known by our shepherd, and others should know us by the, how much we look like the good shepherd, and act like the good shepherd, and talk like the good shepherd. And in fact, the good shepherd should be able to point to us and go, that's one of my sheep. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. There's a lot of characteristics about sheep that are kind of interesting, aren't there? Sheep totally lack a sense of direction, don't they? You ever watch sheep out in the field? They're like one starts taking off and they just all, oh, they're, they're like fat lemmings. And they just kind of all, oh, he's going over there, let's follow him. There's a cliff. So what? It's new. I like fluffy sheep bombs. They wander off. They're forever getting lost. My aunt Wanda had sheep. She had a lot of sheep. And I can tell you this, we were forever hunting down the sheep. You'd get like half of them, and as soon as you got half of them back near the pen, they'd kind of start, well, this one's like, that looks good. Let's go over there. Well, I don't think we should go over here. Let's go over there. Okay. And you can almost see their wheels turning. Sheep are wayward by nature. But the good shepherd gathers sheep. He doesn't get weary gathering sheep. Yeah, we used to chase. I finally just said, you know what? It'd be a whole lot easier if we just got a gun. That's what bad shepherds do. They shoot the sheep. There are a lot of shepherds that shoot sheep. And there are sheep that bite shepherds, too. <laughs> you see, the object of a good shepherd is to get the stray sheep back into the fold. Amen? Another characteristic of sheep is they're, they're weak. They're, you ever looked at sheep legs? I mean, they're like pencils. It's like this big, fat body on these skinny, little, tiny legs. And in fact, their legs are so weak that if they get broken, if they break one of the four, they can't get up. It's impossible for them to stand on a broken leg. They'll just lay there and, I'm dead. <laughs> they're weak. They're not exactly, you, they're not, sheep are just, well, they're not macho. Think about it. You ever seen a beware of sheep sign? Like go to somebody's house, beware of sheep, death awaits. You don't see that, right? Because sheep aren't exactly too terrible. You never see like lambzilla. You're not gonna, you're not gonna, Saturday morning, you're not gonna wake up. You used to love that. Back in the, back in the 60s and 70s, every Saturday morning, there was usually like science fiction theater or one of those. You know, there's always some giant ant, some, you know, some giant animal of giant tarantulas giant chickens, but I never saw a giant sheep, <laughs> ever. There was no lambzilla. You're not going to find a gang of sheep, you know, doing <laughs> flashing signs and, you know, flying colors, you know, whatever. You're not, you're not going to find that. They're not exactly fearsome. Sheep are weak. They need shepherds. They get in trouble. 
And calling some more of the sheep, as a general rule, doesn't do a whole lot for them. It's going, oh, I'm, I'm as weak as you are. They need the good shepherd. They're defenseless in some ways. And it's so true with us. Sheep are also one of the dirtiest animals you will ever meet. They're walking blobs of oil-coated Velcro. If you ever get around sheep, I'm telling you, if they have not been kept clean by the shepherd, if the shepherd hasn't guided them and led them to nice green pastures and kept them out of the foxtails and out of the cockleburs and out of the tumbleweeds and out of the dirt and out of the rocks and out of the debris, you will have like dust bunny sheep. They'll look like those things in the corner of of that spare room that you have where you never get with the vacuum cleaner. You know what I'm saying. You pick it up, it's like, this thing weighs four pounds. <laughs> it's like every piece of dust and dirt that was ever in your house ended up in that one corner. That sheep, it's like, <laughs> just right on to them. They're dirty. They don't smell so good. And the good shepherd keeps them cleaned up. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all the filthiness that we get ourselves into. Amen? Amen. He's the good shepherd. Sheep are also not the, the well, you're, you're not going to find a sheep think tank. <laughs> you, you, there won't be like a brain trust for sheep. You, they're not, you, you're just not going to find it. They kind of do about all they can do just staying alive. And so they need the shepherd's voice to get them from place to place. They find themselves lacking all the time. But the good shepherd cares for sheep. Doesn't matter how lacking in moral character they are. Doesn't matter how much they're not able to fend for themselves. He doesn't care how dirty they get. He just loves sheep. The good shepherd loves sheep. I'm so thankful that the good shepherd loves us as his sheep. Sheep are also kind of grumbly and complainy. You ever notice how, if you ever get around a herd, a, a herd of sheep, you're going to hear, constantly. It's like, I hate this. <laughs> I want more water. Everything a sheep says sounds like they're whining. <laughs> they're never satisfied. And as humankind, we're pretty much never satisfied, amen? amen? Get inside the sheepfold. We're like looking for holes in the wall. Hey, Bob, look over here. It's like there's some grass out there. We're always looking for some place else to be, somewhere else to go, something that's going to be more satisfying than what we already have. You can see it in our lifestyle. You can see it in our clothes. Anybody else ever feel like you need to repent when you look in your closet? <laughs> Where did I get that? I didn't know I had seven of those. It must have been a sale at Sam's Club. We have all this stuff, all these things in our lives, and we got cars, and, you know, and I realize not everybody has the same amount of stuff, and we don't all have the same conditions in our lives uniformly, but we are blessed, and yet we look at that stuff, and it's just like, man, I sure wish I had that house, or I sure wish I had that car, I sure wish I wore those clothes, I wish I could shop at that store, or I wish, you know, I could afford the filet mignon. You know, you ever watch people in the menu? They, they look at the menu. Nobody ever initially, what's the cheapest thing? Give me the thing that tastes bad. I'd like the stuff nobody else wants to eat. Most people, when they look at the menu, they go, wow, surf and turf, like that. And then you have it, and it's just like, well, is there a bigger piece? We are the only country on earth that actually serves a 48-ounce porterhouse. Think of how many pounds that is. 
And yet we have, well, you know, we serve a 67 ounce. You know, we, oh, we have 120 ounce. Oh, we have cows walking around our restaurant. <laughs> Carve your own. We're never satisfied. I went to Claim Jumper and, and I thought they gave me a watermelon instead of a potato. I was like, <laughs> what is that? There's eight and a half pounds of butter on this thing. <laughs> oh, that's our small one. We're never satisfied. Sheep are always looking for another place to be, another thing to buy, another thing to do, something other than what they have. It's a problem with marriages, isn't it? Looking around. Well, you know, my husband, you know, my wife. It's pretty much the same problem, isn't it? Not satisfied. The good shepherd gives us satisfaction right where we are. Have you forgotten how gracious the Good Shepherd is? As we were worshiping, you guys sounded awesome tonight, by the way. I was blessed listening to you worship the Lord. But when we worship, we need to remember what we're singing is a sacrifice of praise to our God. It's for Him. It's not for us. We're saying we love you. We trust you. We believe that you're good. Your promises are forever. They are yes and they are amen. God's will is always good, acceptable, and perfect. Amen? Just exactly what Romans 12 said. It's always that way. He doesn't have an alternate, you know, okay, well, except for you, I have a bad will for you. It's always good. If ever there was a, a picture of the good shepherd working in the life of a man, I think it was Joshua. Because he was leading a bunch of wayward sheep. Amen? Think about the children of Israel. They'd spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness, right? So they get to Kadesh Barnea and they look in and they're so filled with unbelief that they see it. And so they wander for 40 years. They finally cross into the promised land and they're still not sure God is good. They're still not sure God's for them. And, and, and Joshua comes on the scene and says there in Joshua 1 that Moses, my servant, is dead. Now there arise and cross the Jordan, you and all these people. It says there, if you read the rest of the chapter, no man will be able to stand against you. And Joshua believed that. For I am with you, and I never fail. I'm always good. And by the end of his life, Joshua had been so uh, unbelievably blessed that what he said to the people was, not one of the promises the Lord God made has he failed to keep to the house of Israel. He believed the shepherd was good. He believed God was good. He believed he is faithful. He believed he is I am. He trusted, he obeyed. And so I simply ask you some questions. If you are a sheep, which I would imagine most of you are, do you hear his voice? Do you hear his voice? Are you listening for his voice? Because if you're one of his sheep, you will. There's actually no other option. My sheep, notice what Jesus said, hear my voice. No uncertainty there. No other option. There's not some other voice you're supposed to listen for. You're supposed to listen for his voice. That's another way of saying you're supposed to hear and read look at, and then obey my word. When I speak, you do the listening.
he also, at the same time as he's speaking, is providing us a way that we can be cleaned up. You see, these problems that sheep have, the good shepherd is the one who fixes those problems. Because we get dirty, we need to be cleaned up, amen? Here in a couple of minutes, we're going to have the prayer team come forward, some of the, some of the guys, some of the ladies, just be, be, to be available so you can pray. And maybe there's something, you know, you, you just, you got outside of the sheepfold. You were looking for a hole in the wall. You were looking for a couple of loose rocks. You were looking for a, uh, maybe a, a low place in the wall so you could get over it. As sheep, we do that sometimes, don't we? We're kind of like, yeah, I don't really like this whole sheep thing. If that's you, all you need to do is just confess to the good shepherd that you're not okay with what you've done and he's faithful and just to cleanse. Wipe it out. Say it's done, it's over. Maybe you're not hearing the voice of the good shepherd as much as you ought to. Maybe, maybe you've kind of wandered outside the fence. Maybe you're no longer hanging around sheep. Anybody had that experience? Maybe you've wandered away from the sheepfold so much so that all you know is wolves. You want to get that off your chest. You want to let that go. And you want to get back in the sheepfold because the good shepherd will let you back through the door. He's not going to keep you out. Jesus said, I, I, I give etern eternal life to them. They won't perish. No one can snatch them. No one can take them away. The only way that sheep stay out of the sheepfold is because they want to stay out of the sheepfold. It's that simple. So if you can't find any sheep, the answer to who moved is you. Because he's always good. And real sheep are always in the habit of following him. And so if you can't see any sheep, you can't see the shepherd, it's time to ask him if you can just simply come back. And what you're going to hear is, of course. I've always loved you because I'm a good shepherd. I've always wanted to get you cleaned up because I'm a good shepherd. I've never thought an evil thought about you. Have you ever thought about that? The good shepherd has never had a single bad thought about you. You have. The world has. Your family has. Your spouse has. Probably most of the people who know you have, but not our good shepherd. I know my thoughts towards you, says the Lord, and they are good. He is the good shepherd. And we who hear his voice, we get to run right back into the sheepfold where it's safe. The world may not be safe, but it's safe in the sheepfold. Amen.